Bear with me one second. Okay. Share screen. Share. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. I can yes. hear you. Yes. Wonderful. Yes. Okay. All right. And can everyone see my screen? Is my screen on there? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Great. All right. From there. <laughs> Okay, and okay. All right, let's start with some prayer. If um, you could all bow your heads, please. Dear Heavenly Father, mighty creator of all and sustainer of life, we come before you today, dear Lord, united as one on your on your holy Sabbath day. We thank you for your promise that when two or more are gathered, Father, that you will be there. We welcome your presence, Father. We ask that you will please lead us today in the study of Isaiah 40. We ask, Father, that you cleanse us of our sins and bring us to a right spirit that we may glorify you, Father, with our thoughts and our actions. Open up our hearts and minds that we may receive your holy word, Father. And grant us courage to speak as the Holy Spirit prompts our hearts. We thank you, Lord, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay. Well, good morning, everyone, and happy Sabbath. Um, today's lesson is Comfort My People. It's lesson number eight, um, and the passages of Scripture that we're going to be looking at today is from Isaiah chapter 40. Okay, this, today, this lesson here is broken down into five main topics, which come into comfort, preparation, evangelism, strength, worship. Um, hopefully, we'll be able to get through all these topics today. Now, I know Isaiah can be really deep, and I'll, but I'm trying to keep the information um, as simple as possible and keep it to the lesson. So, um, here we go. <laughs> so, Sunday is comfort for the future. So we begin with Isaiah 40, verses 1 and 2. If someone could please read that for me. Um, I have it on the screen if you'd like to read it from there. Comfort, yes, comfort my people, saith your God. Speak comfort to Jerusalem and cry out to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Thank you. The beginning few chapters of Isaiah deals with warnings and rebukes to Jerusalem because of her iniquity. But now in chapter 40, Isaiah is looking into the future and giving a message of forgiveness, peace, and restoration. Isaiah prophetically, 100 years before the Israelites are released from Babylonian captivity, wrote about the coming back from captivity and being settled in the promised land. But this wasn't just prophecy. For them, it was also a symbol not only of literal Israel, but even more so of spiritual Israel and the eternal home of the redeemed in the new Jerusalem at the end of the 1,000 years. Okay. At the end of Sunday's lesson, um, they asked a good, good question for us to consider. What do Bible promises about the end suffering mean to you amid your present suffering? And why is it so important to cling to your faith in those promises, no matter what. Would anyone like to share anything? I feel it's really important for us to cling to our faith because it's gonna show how much we love God and we wanna be with God. And when we go through suffering, it's for the love of God that we do so. Amen, amen. Is there anyone else? Okay. Um, I know for me personally, um, holding on to God's promises gives me peace, hope, and happiness. As some of you may know, I deal with an autoimmune disease that prevents me from doing a lot of things that I would like to do. And in moments where I could get disappointed or depressed because of my particular situation, there have been times um, where God gives me scripture 
many times I don't know where the scripture is com comes from. Well, of course it comes from the Bible, but what I mean is that I don't know where it came from because I wasn't actively thinking about scripture at the moment. I couldn't tell you the chapter or verse or where the scripture comes from, but nonetheless, God speaks to us through his word. Um, an example was the other day, I was finally able to get outside and do some work. I was excited because I hadn't been able to do that in quite a while. So on this particular day, I got up before sunrise and was getting ready to get out there and get my hands dirty. I was excited. Um, <laughs> but for some reason, I couldn't get started. It seemed like everything that could go wrong did. I kept getting stalled for some reason. And, and shamefully, I, I have to admit, my first impulses weren't to be happy and praise God for, you know, um, my present situation. In fact, they were quite the opposite. Inside, I was feeling impatient, frustrated. But you know, God is so good with us. Every time that I started getting impatient or frustrated, a scripture kept coming to mind. It was a be still and know that I am God. It kept popping, popping into my mind. Every time something seemed to go wrong, it made me pause and think about it. And when I did, God was telling me to truly stop. He was saying to me, Juan, I'm the creator of the world. I've given everything for you, so just stop and know that I am in control. Nothing is happening that I'm not allowing. Stop and praise me, for I've already won the battle. He said, stop trying to overcome the situation by your own strength. Your strength is only made perfect in me and in your weakness. Trust in me and know who you serve. And I'll tell you, the moment that I, I did stop and, and recognize who the God was that I served, I had peace and I had joy. And guess what? All the problems started getting resolved one by one. So yes, cling to the promises of God. They are settled in heaven. And keep reminding yourselves that his word is eternal and unchanging, and it will not come back to him void. So that's why I think it's important to keep your faith and hold on to God's promises in the midst of suffering. Um, would anyone else like to, to share anything? Okay. Well, that brings us to Monday, and it's regarding presence, word, and road work. We're going to look at um, Isaiah 43 and 4. If someone could please read that for me. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked place shall be made straight and the rough places smooth. Thank you, brother. Um, this scripture here is packed with many important future events. Isaiah was looking way into the future. Not only was he dealing with the captivity and release of God's people from Babylon, but he was speaking here about Christ the Messiah coming as well as Jesus' second return when he comes to bring us home. Okay. Now he talks about preparation for the coming of Messiah. And in Matthew chapter 3, 1 through 2, we hear about John the Baptist. Would someone um, please read the verse for me there on Matthew 3, 1 through 2. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judah, Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Thank you. You'll notice those are the same words that Jesus said when he started his earthly ministry in Matthew 4.17. If someone wouldn't mind please reading that for me. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Thank you. Now, there are different phases of the kingdom of heaven. There is the first phase, which is God's grace. This was established at the first coming of Christ in a very powerful way. And that was the kingdom that John the Baptist was referring to, as well as the kingdom that Jesus was referring to when he said, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. But there is a second aspect of the kingdom of heaven, and that is, the, that is God's glory. This phase of the kingdom takes place when Jesus comes the second time, 
And that's something that Isaiah also refers to in this chapter. But here, but here he's referring to the first coming of Christ and the establishment of the grace of the kingdom of, of heaven. And then we have the apostle Matthew who wrote these words in Matthew chapter 3, verse 3. Could someone please read that for me? For this is he who of whom it, is, it was spoken by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Thank you. So Matthew recognized that the prophecy in Isaiah chapter 40 was really a reference to John the Baptist in preparing for Jesus' first coming his coming in grace. But not only was the reference to John the Baptist who came to prepare for Jesus, but in a real um, real sense, it also was a prophecy with reference to God's end time people who like Israel of old is to be preparing the world now for the second coming of Christ, his coming in glory. Israel was to prepare the world for the first coming. God's people today are to prepare the world for the second coming of Christ. And we, like John the Baptist, have a message that is to go to the world, a message that will prepare God's people for the second coming of Christ. So today there's a work similar to that of John the Baptist in preparing the world for the second coming of Christ. This end time work of preparation is represented by three angels' message of Revelations um, chapter 14, verse 6, six. Excuse me. This is God's end time message that goes to the world to prepare people for the second coming of Christ. Okay, um, can someone please read that for me? Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell upon the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Thank you. Why does the everlasting gospel have to go to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people? Okay, well, one of the reasons is because the second coming of Christ is going to affect every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. It goes to all the world, the message is saying with a loud voice, the first angel's message. Fear God and give him glory for his hour of judgment has come. John the Baptist's message was, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So our message today is repent, fear God, give him glory, for the hour of his judgment has come. John the Baptist was saying the kingdom is at hand, so there is a similarity in the message John the Baptist was giving to the message that we are called to give in these last moments of Earth's history. We are to call people to worship God as their creator, and we need to remember the hour of his judgment has come, and soon the kingdom of glory will come when Jesus comes the second time. Now we're going to look at Revelations 14, 7 through 8. If someone could please read that for me. Worship him that made the heavens and earth, the sea and the springs of water. And another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations to drink the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Thank you. So here we find in Isaiah chapter 40 a reference to the proclamation of John the Baptist preparing the way for the first coming of Christ. But it's also clear from Isaiah 40 that there is a broader, fuller application of this in God's people proclaiming an end time warning message before Jesus comes again. And that brings us into focus as God's people in the last days, excuse me, we have a message to take to the world. There's um, a quote from Testimonies, Volume 7, page 19. Um, if someone wouldn't mind reading that for me. In a special sense, Seventh-day Adventists have been set in the world as watchmen and light bearers. To them has been entrusted the last warning for a perishing world. On them is shining wonderful light from the word of God. They have been given a work of the most solemn import, the proclamation of the first, second, and third angel's message. There is no other work of so great importance. They are to allow nothing else to absorb their attention. Thank you. 
So today we have been given a message that needs to go to all the world, a message that prepares people for the second coming of Christ. So let's look at Isaiah 40, um, verse 5. If someone could please read that for me. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Okay, let's also look at um, Matthew 24. Okay, if someone could please read this for me. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the, all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. Thank you. So Jesus comes again in his own glory. He comes with the glory of the kingdom, or he's seated upon the throne. All the angels come with Jesus. They have their own glory. It will be an amazing event when Jesus comes. It's going to affect every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. And that's why the three angels' message goes to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Um, and that brings us to the end of this section. Would anyone like to add anything before we move on to, to Tuesday? Okay. All right. Well, that brings us to Tuesday, um, which is evangelism. And um, we're going to be looking at Isaiah 40, verse 9. If someone wouldn't mind reading that, please. O Zion, bring us good tidings. Get thee up unto the high mountain. O Jerusalem, that bring us good tidings. Lift up thy voice with strength. Lift it up, be not afraid. Say unto the cities of Judea, Behold your God. Thank you. You see here in Scripture the phrase, O Zion, and then the next phrase says, O Jerusalem. Why is God addressing a hill and a city to bring good tidings? You see, Zion was conquered by David and eventually was called Jerusalem. And when the temple was built there, it represented the dwelling place of God and God's people. So God is calling out to his people to proclaim good tidings to the world. God is calling Jerusalem, or he's calling his church today to, pro to proclaim good news, to proclaim an everlasting gospel that has to go to all the world, preparing people for the second coming of Christ. Can someone please read um, Isaiah 40 verse 10 for me there? Behold, the Lord God will come with a strong hand, and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his work is before him. Isaiah here is proclaiming the second coming of Jesus. We can see the parallel scripture here in Revelation 22, verse 12. If someone wouldn't mind reading that, please. And behold, I'm coming quickly, Jesus says. My reward is with me to give to every man according to his works. Thank you. That happens when Jesus comes the second time. We can see that here. The arm of the Lord is extended in mercy to the righteous, but it comes to judgment to the wicked. Now we're going to look at Isaiah 51 verse 5, which elaborates more on what the arm of God is. If someone wouldn't mind, please reading that for me. My righteousness is near. My salvation has gone forth, and my arm will judge the people. The coastlines will wait upon me, and on my arm they will trust. Okay, so we see here that those who put their trust in God, they shall not be ashamed. They, they can trust on his arm. Why his arm? The arm is referenced many times, the arm of God or the arm of is symbolic of God's deliverance, God's strength, God's power, and God's promises. We can put our trust in the promises of God. We can rest in his arm. He will bring deliverance. Let's look now at Isaiah 40, verse 11. Um, if someone could please read that for me. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather 
the lamb with his arm. You shall gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and shall gently lead those that are with young. Okay. Um, the care of Christ for his church, for his people, is often likened to the work of a shepherd. As a good shepherd gently leads his sheep and carries the weak and the young, so Christ will provide strength and comfort for his people. One of the tools that a shepherd carried with him was a, a staff. The staff was a long stick which had different instruments on each end. Well, sometimes it was two separate sticks, um, but the one end had a curved edge and resembled a hook. This end of the shaft was used to guide the sheep in the right direction and to keep the sheep in line. It was how the shepherd guided his flock. The other end was known as the rod, and this end was just like a stick, just a regular end of a stick. But this end of the staff was not used on the sheep. It was used on the sheep's enemies that were looking to harm the sheep when they strayed from the flock or when they weren't paying attention to the shepherd. This end was used to protect the sheep. Um, this next slide um, is from Desire of Ages and portrays nicely the relationship, I think, um, between a shepherd and the flock. If someone could please read that for me. He calleth his own sheep by name and leadeth them out. And the sheep follow him for they know his voice. The Eastern shepherd does not drive his sheep. He depends not upon force or fear, but going before he calls them. They know his voice and obey the call. So does the Savior shepherd with his sheep. As the shepherd goes before his sheep, himself first encountering the perils of the way, so does Jesus with his people. When he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them. The way to heaven is consecrated by the Savior's footprints. The path may be steep and rugged, but Jesus has traveled that way. His feet have pressed down the cruel thorns to make the pathway easier for us. Every burden that we are called to bear, he himself has borne. Thank you. Now, Jesus refers to this in John 10, 11. He says, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and they know my own. Um, and then in John 10, verse 16, he says, other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, of this fold, them also I will bring and they shall hear my voice and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. So Jesus is talking to the Israelites saying there are others out there in the Gentile world. They're mine. And today Jesus is saying, I have sheep yet in Babylon. They're mine. It says, they also I must bring. They will hear my voice. There will be one flock and there will be one shepherd. So Jesus makes a prediction. He says, I have sheep. They're out there. They will hear my voice. They will come. There'll be one flock and one fold and there will be one shepherd. Now, where's the fulfillment of what Jesus is referring to here? The fulfillment of this prophecy made by Jesus is found in Revelations chapter 18, um, 1 and 2, we have, excuse me, um, we have what we call the third angel's message. If someone could please read that scripture here for me. After these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority. The earth was illuminated with his glory, and he cried mightily with a loud voice, saying, Babylon, the great, is fallen, is fallen. Thank you. Of course, the second angel talks about Babylon being fallen, fallen. We have a repeat of the second angel's message in Revelation 18, and the message is given, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, has become the devil hold of devils and foul spirits, and so on. And after the message is given, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, then we find in verse 4, and I heard another voice from heaven. This is the voice of Jesus saying, come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins, unless you receive her plagues. So at the end of time, as God's church is proclaiming the three angels message and is preaching the truth to truth that Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Jesus 
is in the work of calling his faithful people to come out of the religious confusion and to make their stand with God's Bible-believing people. But in order for Jesus to call his faithful ones to come out of religious confusion, the message must be given. The preaching of the three angels' message needs to go to the world, and Jesus calls on us to accomplish this. We all, both men and women, have a responsibility to let God use us to give his most important message to the world so that the end of evangel so um okay that's the end of the evangel evangelism section um would anyone like to add anything or does anyone have any thoughts regarding this this section I, I, I would just add that you know, when, you, when you examine the messages clearly and, and what it's saying here, it's, it's not just the words that need to be spoken. The, the words need to be taken to heart and lived out. And that living witness is how the message right. is going to go to all the earth, that the earth is lightened with his glory. Amen. Amen. So yeah, we, we need to reflect um, God's character, Jesus's character, you know, and that needs to be represented to, to everyone around us. You know, um, if we have all this knowledge and, and we don't have love, then it means nothing, you know? Um, so amen, brother, I, I hear what you're saying. Yeah. In, in verse one, actually, when it says that, you know, the angel has great power or great authority that, that word in the Greek is the word exousia, and it actually means the power to choose. Mm. That, that the message comes and you realize that you, you yourself already have the power to choose to obey and to be that witness. But you have to make that choice yourself in order to be able to properly bid others to make the same choice. Amen. Amen. Um, does anyone else have anything they'd like to share? Okay, if not, um, we'll move on to, I believe we're on Wednesday now, um, which is titled Merciful Creator. Um, we're going to be looking at Isaiah 40, 12 through 17. So um, if someone wouldn't mind reading that, please. Twelve through seventeen. Yes, please. Who hath measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, and meted out heaven with the hand <coughs> span, and comprehended the dust of the earth in a measure, and weighed the mountains in scales, and the hills in a balance? Who hath directed the spirit of the Lord, or being his counselor, hath taught him? With whom took he counsel, and who instructed him, and taught him in the path of judgment, and taught knowledge, and shrewd to him the way of understanding? Behold, the nations are as a drop of a bucket, and are counted as the small dust of the balance. Behold, he taketh up the isles as a very little thing. And Lebanon is not sufficient to burn, nor the beast thereof sufficient for a burnt offering. All nations before him are as nothing, as they are counted to him less than nothing in vanity. Thank you, sister. Well, that's a lot to unpack. Um, well, Isaiah here is referring to Israel, that although they might feel overwhelmed by their enemies, the reality in comparison to God's power and strength, the enemies of God's people are, are as nothing. In the days of Isaiah, the Assyrians were the greatest and most feared nation on earth. But the Lord here reminds his people that in comparison to himself, the nations of earth are as nothing. Regardless of the plans and the purposes of men, God will ultimately bring his people's own plans to pass. And we see this wonderfully illustrated with Nebuchadnezzar, who just 
a hundred years prior, I'm sorry, um, after this, came and conquered Jerusalem in 605 BC and took the Jews captive. Um, Nebuchadnezzar learned something of the true God, the God of the Hebrews. Um, he was open to listening to what Daniel had to say. Um, but one day Nebuchadnezzar had a dream and in his dream, he saw a giant tree with lots of leaves and lots of fruit. But then he heard the call from heaven, a message from heaven. Cut down the tree and set a band of iron and brass around the stump and leave it there for seven times or seven years. Nebuchadnezzar, not fully understanding what this was all about, called for Daniel. Daniel came and gave the meaning to the king. And Daniel explained that in this dream, he was represented by this giant tree that seemed to fill the whole earth and had lots of fruit and beautiful lush, lush leaves on it. But the voice from heaven was a decree from God because of his pride that he would be cut down. Of course, we all know the story. Um, he was warned by Daniel and Daniel told him to repent and he did it. As a result, Nebuchadnezzar went mad and for seven years he ran around like a wild animal. Um, Daniel, knowing the prophecy, may have preserved the throne for Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of those seven years, his understanding returned to him. And now in Daniel chapter 4, we actually have Nebuchadnezzar writing an account of his own experience. This is or used to be a pagan king, the king of the most powerful nation on the earth at that time, who is now acknowledging the God of heaven. And we have good evidence to believe that Nebuchadnezzar will actually be in the kingdom one day. And he wrote, as he wrote Daniel chapter 4, and this is what he says after the experience. Um, can someone please read Daniel chapter 4, verse 34 for me here? At the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up my eyes to heaven, and my understanding returned to me. And I blessed the Most High, praised and honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and its kingdom is from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. He does according to his will in the army of heaven and amongst the inhabitants of the earth. No one can restrain his hand or say to him, what have you done? Amen. Um, and Brother Phil, would you mind reading that next verse too? Verse, 37. Yeah, verse 37. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven. All of those works are true in his ways, justice. And those who walk in pride, he is able to put down. Amen. So God calls upon his creatures to turn their attention from the confusion and perplexity around them and his, admire his handiwork. The heavenly bodies are worthy of contemplation. God has made them for the benefit of man. And as we study his works, angels of God will be by our side to enlighten our minds and guard us from satanic deception. As you look at the wonderful things God has made, let your proud, foolish heart feel its dependence and inferiority. As you consider these things, you will have a sense of God's condescension. Consension. <laughs> um, so I, I really like that that quote here from Ellen White, because um, Nebuchadnezzar had to be brought, had to be humbled to such an extent that he was literally in nature. <laughs> I mean, on all fours, like an animal. Um, so he would have to consider the things that were around, the things that were created by God. Um, and it, it's, it's sad that it took seven years for him to, to really truly understand but praise God that he got to that point where, where he truly saw the, the power of God and who God was. Um, so that's all that we have here for Thursday. If anyone would like to add anything, um, please do so.
Okay. Well, if no one has anything to add, I will move on to Thursday, which has to do with um, worship. Um, so we're going to look at Isaiah 40, verse 18. If someone could please read that for me. I'll just add quickly before you go there. Sure, uh, sure. I thought it was, it was really interesting that um, sometime in the past few months, I saw uh, it was a completely worldly doctor. They, they weren't a believer. They weren't a Christian or anything, but they were, um, they helped people with back pain and with chronic back pain. And the solution that this doctor came up with was that they should do a particular take they should do a particular stretching exercise each day and that stretching exercise looked basically exactly like that picture that just came before this one mm. where they were bowed down on their knees and stretched out their arms in front of them and put their head down <laughs> and they said if you just do that every day it will help your back pain amen, amen. and i was like praise the <laughs> lord that's that's what we're supposed to do and that we don't do and it causes pain in our lives. Wow. wow. <laughs> Even a worldly doctor got it. <laughs> Amen. Amen. I'm going to, I'm going to have to start doing that more because <laughs> I, I do suffer from back pain and I, 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 I do not pray this way, but praise God. I mean, this is how we should be praying, I guess. <laughs> Thank you for sharing brother. Okay, um, if someone would please um, read this for me, Isaiah 40, verse 18. To whom then will you liken God, or what likeness will you compare unto him? I'm sorry, sister, you cut off. Um... Um, okay, I'll try again. Uh -huh. To whom then will you liken God, or what likeness will you compare unto him? Okay. Am I still cutting off? No, no, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I think I, I messed oh, up on this slide. This might be 18 and 19 here. Um, let me just, just finish the, the, the quote here. Um, will you liken him too? The workman molds an image of the gold over spreads it with gold. The silversmiths cast silver chains. Whoever is to impoverish for such a contribution chooses a tree that will not rot. He seeks for himself a skillful workman to prepare a carved image that it will not um, totter. I'm sorry, I think I might have messed up on this slide. It might be um, Isaiah 40. Um, 18 to 18, 20. 18 to 20. Um, so I'm sorry about that, Sister Deidre. Um, oh, no worries. Okay. Um, at this time that Isaiah was writing this, the Hebrews had adopted many of the practices of the nations around them, including the worship of idols. Now, the Hebrews didn't really believe that the idol was able to do things for them. They believed the idol was a representation of God. And even today, there are many that bow down to idols, not believing the idol has some power, but that the idol is a representation of God. And even Isaiah says that's wrong. You are not to bow down to a representation of God. How can you try and represent God with something that you can make with your hands? The prophet points out the foolishness of thinking that an idol can represent the omnipotent, the all-powerful, excuse me, God. Of course, the first angel's message calls us to worship God as the creator, the one who made the heaven and the earth. Um, now we're going to look at Isaiah 40, verse 21. If someone could please read that for me. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told to you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth that he who sits above the circle of the earth and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. Thank you. 
So here Isaiah is saying, haven't you heard God is greater than everything? <laughs> and of course, we find this, this truth in the New Testament in Romans 1, 20 through 23. If someone could please read what Paul is saying here. Romans 1, 20 through 23. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are not with they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful but became futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened. Confessing to be wise, they became as fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like the corruptible man, like birds, four-footed animals, and creeping things. Thank you. In the SDA Bible commentary, we have a statement and it says, many who bear the name of Christians are serving other gods besides the Lord. Our creator demands the supreme devotion of our allegiance. Anything which trends, tends to abate our love for God or to interfere with the service due him becomes thereby an idol. And we Christians need to be careful of this as well. It's all too dangerous and easy for each of us to make an idol in our own hearts. Anything that would separate us from God can become an idol. Isaiah chapter 40, verses 23 and 24, warns us about this. Um, he brings the princesses to nothing. He makes the judges of the earth useless. Scarcely shall they be planted. Scarcely shall they be sown. Scarcely shall their stock take root in the earth, when he will also bow, blow on them, and they will wither, and the whirlwind will take them away like stubble. We must remember that we become what we behold. Um, if someone could please read 2 Corinthians um, chapter 3, verse 18 for me. But we all with uncovered face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Amen. So we must be careful not to behold anything else or to hold anything so dearly in our hearts except our lord and savior because whatever we hold in our hearts will lead to our either our eternal life or eternal destruction in other words what's your foundation jesus said in uh, matthew 7 verses 24 through 27 um, if someone could please read that for me Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house upon a rock. The rains descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat upon the house, and it did not fall, for it was founded upon the rock. But whoever hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be likened to a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell. And great was its fall. Okay, so what we see here is that we're all building something. We are building characters, every one of us. You know, um, we, we have to build up our faith, and we have to have a surety in Jesus. You know, it, eventually there's going to be a storm and our faith is going to be tested. Depending on what you're building on will determine whether you stand when the trial comes. Jesus says, whoever does these things shall be likened to a wise man who built on the rock. And we know that rock is Jesus. Okay, um, that brings us to our conclusion. 
um, of this section, um, and we're going to look at Isaiah 40, verse 25. To whom then will you liken me, or to whom shall I be equal, saith the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high, and see who has created these things, who brings out their host by number. He calls them all by name, by the greatness of his might and his strength of his power. Not one is missing. Is there anything too hard for God to do? We look at the trials and difficulties in our life, and like Israel of old, we say, Lord, where are you? Why don't you listen? My enemy is coming up against me, and God says, I have it covered. Trust me. Put your trust in me. Um, we're going to look at Isaiah 40, verses 27 and 28. Could someone please read that for me? Why do you say, O oh Jacob, and speak, O oh Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord, and my just claim is passed over by my God. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. Thank you, sister. Uh, many in Judea felt that God had forgotten them in their time of need. But Isaiah was reminding them that God never fails to consider or notice their needs. Jesus says, don't worry. I'm always there with you. Um, in Isaiah 40, 29 through 31, God's people are reminded. He gives power to the weak, and those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youths shall faint and be weary. The young men shall utterly fall, but he who waits upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up on wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not be faint. In Steps to Christ, chapter 11, Ellen White explains the might and the power of God and how ultimately we can find comfort because of his greatness. Take to him everything that perplexes your mind. Nothing is too great for him to bear, for he holds or upholds the worlds. He rules over the affairs of the universe. Nothing in any way, nothing that in any way concerns our peace is too small for him to notice. There is no chapter in our experience too dark for him to read. There is no perplexity too difficult for him to unravel. No calamity can befall the least of his children. No anxiety harasses, no anxiety harass the soul, no joy cheer. No sincere prayer escapes the lips of which our heavenly father is unobservant or in which he takes no immediate interest. The relationship between God and each soul are as distinct and full as though there were not another soul upon the earth to share his watch care, not another soul for which he gave his son. The message of Isaiah from God is that you can find comfort in him who sustains all things. God says, fear not for I am with you. And I, I, I thought this kind of poignant that um, Isaiah 40 ends um, and the beginning of Isaiah 41 is um, verse 10 says, fear not for I am with you. And um, that's all I have. <laughs> so does anyone have anything else they would like to add to the study or any thoughts? Anyone? I'll just add that in, in verse 26, when he tells us to look up to the starry heavens and to see how great his might is because of that, and that he calls all of those billions and trillions of stars are infinite, we really don't know, um, by name. It says, at least in the King James, not one faileth um, uh, or is lacking or wanting. And I think that just goes to show that a lot of what science teaches us today is really science falsely so-called. The, the whole idea that there are stars that, that blow up in supernovas and that's what seeded the universe with, with the elements needed for life. It's, 
it's, it's totally contradicted by this verse. God says what he makes doesn't fail. <laughs> God, God did not make stars to blow up. <laughs> um, that, that's totally an, an earthly evolutionary mindset that, that gives that idea uh, as an explanation of what we see in the heavens. Amen. Amen. So true. Um, so I, I think that's all we have. Um, I'd like to close with prayer. Um, would anyone like to volunteer to close? I'll pray. Thank you. Thank you, Lord, kind Heavenly Father, for this wonderful, beautiful Sabbath day. Thank you for bringing all your children together to be able to go over your quarterly study this week. And Lord, we enjoy the time with you. Thank you for all the blessings you do for everyone. And thank you for this day of rest, for the whole world needs the day of rest. And having you with us makes us stay in peace in the heart and soul. Thank you, God, for everything you do. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Amen. All right. Well, okay. thank, you. thank you, everyone. Um, I, service will be 1130. And Pastor Juan will send out those links for Zoom. Thank you. Amen. See you soon. See you soon. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Hey, Angelo. Thank you, Juan. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.